when looking at the demographic statistics of Turkey, one might think they are in a very good place. They have a relatively high fertility rate, a young and conservative population and seemingly rising religiosity. However, when looking deeper into the statistics in Turkish society, things aren't as good as they actually seem. When researching the total fertility rate of Turkey, you directly get presented a figure of around 1.9 children per woman. However, this figure is completely wrong. I don't know where the site got these numbers from, but just with a little bit of further researching, various other sources, including the Turkish Health Ministry, Turkish fertility rate is actually much lower, sitting around 1.62 children per woman. Lower as in countries such as Romania, France or Sweden. It's also decreasing at a massive rate, as it's down from 2.2 in 2014 to 1.89 in 2021. Also the mean age for the mother at first birth increased to European levels at 26.7 in 2022 and the mother's overall mean age went up from 26.7 and 21 to 29.2 in 2022. The median age of the population nearly doubled from 1970s 17.5 years to 30.6 years in 2020, which is also due to increasing life expectancy. It even becomes more evident when looking at the bigger picture, as the fertility decreased rapidly over the decades from 7 children per woman in 1950 to 4 children in 1980. While that was a lot of numbers, when looking at the statistics one might argue that these numbers are normal for a country that transitioned from a poor agricultural nation to a more developed urban one. Also people often say that the big drop in fertility rate is mainly caused by decreasing teen pregnancies. Sadly, that couldn't be further from the truth. As I researched this topic deeper and deeper, it became even worse and it seems that the government does even try to make these numbers look higher than they actually are. The actual fertility rate of Turkish women is probably close to the levels of other sovereign European countries, such as Italy and Spain and much lower than that of Greece or Portugal. But let me explain. These numbers doesn't apply to all of the country. As you can see in this map, there is a huge divide in nearly every economic and cultural statistic between the western and the eastern part of the country. The numbers in every metric get even more extreme in the southeast of the country. Doesn't matter if you look at youth unemployment, GDP per capita, poverty rate, literacy rate and any major demographic statistic. In a lot of cases, these numbers do differ quite drastically. Not only a little bit like between the regions in east and west Germany or southern and northern Italy, but the divide is quite extreme. Turkey is probably the country with the biggest economic and demographic divide inside one nation outside of Africa. But what is it that gives a seemingly united country such a big difference? Well, one might argue that it has to do something with higher numbers of conservatism and religiosity in the southeastern regions. However, this is only partly the case. In general, you can say that in Turkey, the more west you go, the more liberal the people generally are. Peaking in the city of Izmir and the more east you go, the more conservative the people get. Peaking in the region around Urfa. However, it's not only that. There is also a north-south divide. In short terms, the regions around the Mediterranean Sea are more liberal than those in the north at the Black Sea coast. But there are a lot of exceptions here. One example is the city of Konya, lying in the geographical west. It's the most religious and conservative out of all regions in the country. The city of Tunjeli in the east is classified as one of the most liberal cities in the country, alongside Izmir, Bursa and Istanbul. There is an answer for this divide though, and as you might already guess, the explanation is ethnicity. The population in Turkey is made up of four big demographic groups. At first, there's of course Turkish people, a homogeneous ethnic group making up around 72% of the population a figure comparable to that of Germans in Germany and Swedes in Sweden. The second group are the expatriates and people that migrated back to Turkey after spending some time in European countries, mostly as guest workers from Germany or the Netherlands. In this demographic group there are also a lot of Turkish people that returned from the Balkan countries like Bulgaria or Albania that settled there during the Ottoman times. They make up around 2 to 3 percent of the total population and they mostly settled in the Balkan regions in the far northwest Istanbul or on the Mediterranean coast, mostly near Antalya. The third group are the refugees from countries like Syria and Afghanistan, making up around 7 to 10 percent of the population. They are very important in the political landscape of the country and its demographics, and we will talk about them later in this video. The last major group are the Kurdish people, which lived in the border regions in the southeast since thousands of years. They are totally different in language, belief system, family structure, and religion than the Turkish people. Genetically, Kurdish people are much closer 
to Iranians and they are to Turkish people. They make up around 90% of the population and their share is rising. However, Kurdish people are not a single tribe, but they are made up of a lot of smaller people groups, which are very complicated to describe, as the sources and explanations differ from whom you ask and what source you take. As far as I understood, there are Kurdish people and Zazas, who speak different languages each. They also have different religious affiliations, with sizable minorities in both groups practicing Alevism instead of Sunni Islam. But for the sake of this video, I will classify this group as Kurdish. The Kurdish people always were seen as a threat to Turkish society, as they don't support the state and they engage in huge separatism movements. There were some minor and some major conflicts and rebellions in the past, which accumulated to a death count of more than 120,000 deaths in the last 100 years. As said before, the Kurdish people are mostly concentrated in the southeastern regions of the country, creating a huge cultural gap between Kurdish and Turkish majority regions. That gap can be explained by two things. At first, the denying of the Turkish state and state-owned facilities by the Kurdish people, and second, the discrimination of the Kurdish people by the state. The constant separatism slowed the development of these provinces. To this day, around 17% of the female population in southeast Anatolia are literate, and there is a huge gender gap, causing the people there to have much higher fertility rates than in the more developed Turkish majority parts of the country. The constant rise of the Kurdish population is seen as a huge threat for the state and will probably lead to political problems in the future. The region is also very hard to control as there are a lot of huge mountain ranges, most notably the Zagros Mountains. A lot of cities are very secluded and in some places there isn't even the basic infrastructure. Developing a region in such a terrain is a major challenge, even in more harmonic circumstances. However, one cannot ignore the overall trends. The Kurdish regions are developing fast and their birth rate is declining rapidly. By percentage, the high fertility Kurdish regions had even higher fertility decline than the Turkish majority regions. But still, the gap is quite big. There are no official statistics for the demographic groups in their country, but it's estimated that the Kurdish people had a fertility rate of around 2.7 children in 2023, falling from 3.5 in 2014. The share of the population will at least rise to about 25% in the following decades, creating a huge problem for current politicians as a Kurdish minded party could be voted with high numbers into parliament. There is also a big inner migration trend from Kurdish people in the southeast to the big cities in the west. Istanbul is the city with the most Kurdish people in all of Turkey, numbering around 2 to 3 million. Although Kurdish people that migrated to Turkish majority provinces tend to be more liberal and get quote Turkified, they still have in general higher birth rates than their Turkish counterparts. That means that the fertility rate of Turkish people is probably much lower than the estimated 1.5 children per woman. However, the demographic threat by Kurdish people is only the tip of the iceberg. Turkey accepted refugees long before it became a trend in Western Europe. Since the start of the Syrian civil war in 2011, Turkey saw a huge influx of refugees from that region. Official numbers state that Syrians number around 3.6 million people in Turkey. However, many people state that the actual numbers are even higher, some even claiming it to be around 5 million. Most of the Syrian refugees live in the regions near the Syrian border, where their share is often near 20% of the population. The highest shares are in the provinces of Kilis, with 31. 5%, Antep with 16.5%, Hatay with 15.1%, Urfa with 11.5%, Mersin with 10% of the population. However, there are also a lot of Syrians living in the big urban centers in the west of the country. Istanbul is the province which hosts the most Syrian refugees, numbering around 500,000. Bursa and Izmir also host around 150,000 Syrians each. Keep in mind that these numbers only include registered refugees and the real numbers are probably much higher. Around a third of the overall refugees are claimed to be children under 18 and 55% are women, though these numbers are necessarily reliable. Most of the Syrians living in Turkey, around 80%, identify themselves as Arab, though there are also sizable minorities of Syrian Turkmen 
and Kurdish people. But there are also a lot of refugees from other countries, mainly Afghanistan and Ukraine. Data on both of these groups are limited, but according to official estimates, there are about 85,000 Ukrainians living in Turkey, mainly Crimean Tatars and Meshkazian Turks, and about 300,000 Afghans. There is no data on where in the country other refugee groups live, but according to experience for myself and friends I've talked to, most Ukrainians live in Istanbul and other big cities in the west, while most Afghans live in Ankara, Black Sea Coast. In recent years, there has been a lot of anti-refugee sentiment across the young population, growing hatred against especially Afghan and Syrian people. This got mainly fueled due to the economic crash, rising youth unemployment and the rising crime rate among refugees. A friend of mine stated that compared to the situation in Turkey, the European refugee problems are harmless. In the streets of Turkey's worst neighborhoods, police isn't operating well or people aren't even calling the police at all because of low trust in the state that led to a creation of refugee gangs and clans all over the country especially Adana on the Mediterranean coast has a lot of gang related problems on the other hand a lot of refugees also own their own businesses and have the economy growing though the official number of Syrians is decreasing due to people returning to their home countries as the war has cooled down in a lot of regions the unofficial numbers are rising quickly there are about half a million babies born with Syrian origin the median age for Syrian migrants is 22 years nearly 10 years younger than the overall Turkish population. The fertility rate for Syrian women is at 5.3 children per woman. These shocking numbers can be explained that most Syrians live in the impoverished regions in the far southeast, which are also the same regions that got affected the most by the 2023 earthquake. These are also the exact regions in which there is a Kurdish majority. Due to the Syrian people living in much more extreme poverty, in general populations, physical labor is needed, which can be achieved by simply getting more kids. This isn't the only reason though. I guess it can be explained by a mixture of high illiteracy rates among women and girls, unavailability of contraceptions and a rising level of nationality or pride. There are also a lot of people abusing the situation of refugee women and selling them on market for secondary marriages. Men who want a second wife just go to a black market and get a Syrian wife there in exchange for money or livestock. In a lot of cases, these women just get used as a birthing machine or to help with the household. In some traditional societies, a man who has two or more wives is seen as higher value than a man with only one wife. This practice is most commonly done in Urfa and the highly legal. The Turkish state tries to cutting it down but wasn't that successful yet. The amount of family lawyers in Urfa said to have nearly tripled since the start of the refugee crisis. The mayor of Urfa himself is even said to have a second wife. Sometimes it even feels like the Turkish government itself doesn't even know what's going on in the southeast. Turkey is a country that plays a big role on the world stage and its power will probably only increase over the next decades. However, one cannot deny the fact that Turkey has some huge demographic problems. The current trends are a powder keg which are about to explode. As I've researched this topic, I grew increasingly worried for Turkey. On the other side, it's not all pitch black. Turkey is still a regional power, and compared to European countries, its population is still relatively young and conservative. Erdogan, the Turkish president, knows about the current and future problems, and he openly speaks about it, like in a speech where he said every Turkish woman should have three kids each. Turkish people are quite religious and much less nihilistic than in more developed societies. They have something to live and to die for and there is a strong state unity and national identity. Also the immigrants are coming from other Muslim majority countries and are culturally much closer to them than Syrians and Afghans are to Europeans. The problems they face with the Kurdish people are nothing new and they will find a way to handle it. Every country in the world has its problems and will face hard challenges in the future. Compared to other countries Turkey sits in a relatively comfortable place. One should also not forget that there are still a lot of Turkish people all over Western Europe. And when something happens in Turkey, it has a direct effect on countries like Germany, France and the Netherlands as well. Something that will decide Turkey's future is who will rule over the Middle East. As the United States needs to deal with its own problems, it will increasingly pull out of the international game and that will pull a gap on who is going to have influence over the Middle East. Countries of the region south of Turkey in its current state will guarantee constant destabilization and wars. The only times this region was peaceful was when it got influence 
influenced and united by a higher power, such as the Ottomans, Greeks or Persians in the past. And I think that will likely happen again. Turkey and Iran are increasingly trying to get influence over the Middle East. Although both are pseudo allies at the moment, it won't probably stay this way. In the future, Turkey and Iran will fight economic or even proxy wars about who gets control in this region. Turkey is trying to dam up Iraq's most important river currently, trying to make it an economic puppet state. However, this dam is located in a province where lots of refugees and Kurdish people are living, which is a place they could lose control over. Who gets to control the Middle East could be a major factor of which side would win a potential world war. Iran as a potential ally of Russia and China, while Turkey would be an ally of the Western bloc. I don't see a future in which the United States will completely pull out of this region, as it's just far too economically important. They probably will still aid Turkey to hold its strategic position, while they will stop interfering in the political and economic situation. I see three possible futures for Turkey. The first one would be one in which Iran will pull control over the Middle East, and Turkey will remain as a buffer state between a new Persian Empire and Europe. Turkey would still be economically important, but they will always have to deal with constant threats from the increasing minority population. The economic situation will get worse, and Turkey will become an Arab majority country, not pure by demographics, but by increasing intermediages and religiosity. It will lose its national identity in this case. The second and best scenario for Turkey would be if the economic situation gets better, or better said, gets worse, but at a much slower pace than other countries around the world. They will seize their chance in a weakening of their neighbors and try to get full influence over the region. As the economic situation gets better, the people will also start to have more children, as they see much more sense in creating a family. The whole Ottoman Empire 2.0 will be a state of mixed races, and the Turkish people will probably get treated a lot better than the other minorities. The third scenario would be a civil war-like situation, after some Arab or Kurdish separatist movements declared their independence or started to rebel. The Turkish military will try to intervene. As the Turkish state gets weakened, Aydan tries to seize control over the newly formed Kurdish state and so gets access to the dam to get control over Iraq. In the case of a Turkish civil war, Turkey might lose some territory in the southeast, but they would ultimately win over the rebel groups, as it has a very strong and highly trusted by the population military. In all of these three scenarios, Turkey would still be a relevant player in the region, as it has some of the best geographies in the world. So we will see what future will come true. And maybe I'm completely wrong and something much different will happen. I'm not a military expert, nor am I an economist, but I have made my guesses after reading a lot about Turkish and Persian history and researching the demographic trends in this region for the last week. So I would like to hear your opinions on this topic. Let's make the comment section a peaceful place and not argue aggressively about this topic. See you in the next videos. Cheers!